This is the third and final presentation on ANOVA. And you will find that um, this is, I think, really helpful in helping you kind of understand the bigger picture of what's going on within ANOVA. At least I hope so. So remember, we're in ANOVA land, so we have a categorical independent variable, but now, because we're not a t-test, we can do more than two categories, right? So the statisticians, they got kind of excited about the whole thing, and they started saying, wouldn't it be nice to be able to compare three or four groups with each other instead of just two groups? And running all these t-tests is driving us crazy. So that's what they did. They designed the ANOVA um, for all of us to benefit from. But we're still working with one continuous dependent variable, and that's what makes for a one-way, um, we have one IV and one DV. The one IV is what makes for a one-way ANOVA. The question that it's asking it of the data is, are these groups different? And it can do both between or within subjects design. So you can look at the data of people with themselves, which would be within subjects, comparing, um, you know, me when I'm getting ketamine, me when I'm getting Prozac, me when I'm getting no drugs. Um, or we can divide everybody up and put a third of the people in ketamine, a third of the people getting Prozac, and a third of the people getting no drugs and see how happy they are. All right. So what we're looking for in this is we would like to see low within group variability and high between group variability. If we have that, we should see a significant effect, right? If we have high within group variability, right, a nice platycurtic bell curve spread way out, all right, it's beautiful, but it's not helpful for what we're trying to do. And then low between group variability, so small differences in the mean scores, we will get no difference between our groups. So that's kind of what's happening behind the scenes. Right. This is an example and another picture, um, a couple of pictures actually of data. Here we have three groups, right? Um, for outcome number one, we have significance because that first triple line there on the left, that is nicely clumped together, right? So um, this has small, low between, low within group variability. Everybody in that group is scoring very similarly on the dependent variable there on the left. And then the middle group is a little more spread out, but they're still pretty good. And the group on the right, the same thing. And then you'll see the means, you can see in the mean plot more clearly below, are quite different from each other. And so you get these nice spread outs of the mean scores. Um, then we have on the right, on the right, you see a different kind of outcome. If you have that, you have the first group is all spread out, the second group all spread out, the third group is all spread out across the continuum of possible DV scores. So within each group, you have a lot of variability. People could be all over the place. And then if you look at the bottom, you can even see like the mean scores for the three groups are really similar to each other. Um, they're kind of a nice flat line, meaning they're super similar mean scores. So you have in, in outcome two, you have high within group variability and low between group variability. So this is kind of a different way of looking at it, but this is a common way to present data whenever you're trying to understand um, an ANOVA. All right, so make sure you can answer this question in your portfolio. What's an ANOVA doing? When is it significant? And remember that the means and the variances are both involved. We are not just looking at mean scores. Now, there's a lot of assumptions, but you've seen most of these before, right? So we have independence of scores, meaning that people are independently assigned to their groups and they're, you know, the rat's not running two mazes, right? The person's not getting both ketamine and Prozac, right? So that's a, that's a design assumption, so that the, the study was designed correctly. Then for statistical assumptions, we have normal distribution. ANOVA is pretty robust, and if you have... If you have skewness, you can transform the variables as you were taught in a previous lab, um, which I know no one likes to do transformation of variables, but it will fix your normal distribution problem most of the time. So um, so you probably, in most ANOVAs, you can do a negative one-to-one -one, um, in normal. But again, in my labs, I'll tell you um, what the standard is. And then um, equal sample sizes can be important, especially if you have other problems, um, and it was not a particularly robust design to the study in general, then equal sample sizes can kind of help make up for some other problems, basically. Um, homogeneity of variance, that Levine's test, if it's significant and it violates this assumption, 
Um, that can be a problem, especially if you also have unequal sample sizes and those two are friends of each other um, and they kind of get happy or sad together. Um, but if you have homogeneity of variance problem and your Levine's test is significant and then you also have unequal N, you may have to actually stop the study if it's a real study out in the world. Um, if you're really not passing the normality assumptions and you don't want to transform the variables, there is a whole nother statistical analysis you can do called the Chris Cole Wallace test, which I'm not going to teach you, but I just want you to be aware that it exists out there in case you get stuck at this point sometime in your future when you're running research. So looking more specifically at Levine, at homogeneity of variance, I wanted you to be aware we cover Levine's test because it's the SPSS default and it's super common within the field of psychology. What's happening behind the scenes there is it's running an ANOVA on the deviations from the mean of the groups itself. And of course, not significant is good. That means it's past the assumption. So Levine's test in white there is the most common. But I want you to be aware there's several other things here. And of course, different psychologists, different researchers have their favorites. Um, but it's something you might want to just kind of keep in mind. Some people like the brown forsyth and says that it actually has less deficiencies because it's looking at the median instead of the mean. The Welsh test runs similar to brown forsyth but it has a slightly different calculation. But it's not very good if you have more than four groups. There's something called a James second order method or two stage method. If you have four or more groups, you might need to use that. But people don't generally agree, even among statisticians, of when heterogeneity is a problem and how much of a problem it actually is. Is, so you just kind of have to hang on, report what you have, go with the middle of the road um, is my advice to my students and uh, report your Levine's test and hope that you have fairly equal N. You can always solve the unequal N problem by randomly dropping people from your study um, if you still have the power to run it once you do that. Okay. So what do you do when you run, when you run an ANOVA? How do you report that? Let's kind of walk through this. Um, one of the things you need to report is the size of each of your groups. So if you have three groups, you need to report how many people are in each group um, or rats or whatever you're running. Um, you do need to look at the skewness and kurtosis of your dependent variable. That would be important. And sometimes you need to look at it by group. And in general, in my labs, that's what we'll do. That's because the Mertler and Veneta book does it that way. Um, you need to look at your test of homogeneity of variance. So that's your Levine's test typically. You generally report degrees of freedom. Now in your output, you will get sums of squares and mean squares, but it's very rare to actually report that. I don't think I've ever seen that in an article before, but it is information that comes in the output of SPSS. You'll get an F ratio, um, which is actually just a number, but it is um, the ANOVA ratio. Or if you're doing a t-test, you'll get a t-value. Those things are comparable to each other in terms of what they mean. You'll get a p-value, a probability. You'll hope for p less than 0.05. And then you generally also need to report the means for each group, sometimes the standard deviations of those groups as well, depending on your preferences, at least the means. All right. Once you've reported all that data and you know whether or not you have a significant difference, one of the things that's really interesting about ANOVA is you now have three or more groups a lot of times. And so you know overall that the groups are different, but you don't know which groups are different from which. Like, does ketamine and Prozac both make you better, but nothing makes you worse, right? And that would not be an unusual outcome where you get, you know, two different drugs have relatively similar. They're not really different from each other. Um, or, you know, is ketamine way better than, than Prozac? and Prozac's not that different from no drug um, at all. And that's what you found in your sample. That's probably not what you would expect to find, but you might find it in any particular sample. So if you, you know there's differences because your F test was run and it has a probability of P.03 or something, and you're like, yay, I have a significant ANOVA. Okay, but now I don't even know which groups are different from the others, right? Not significantly so. So you can't answer that with an F test. You need to do a follow-up analysis, and there are multiple things. Now, if you have only two groups, all you got to do is look at them and see which one's higher and lower, right? Because you only have two groups, and you already know they're different. So you're done if you only have two groups. But if you have three or more, you can do something called planned contrasts, meaning I really want to know if ketamine is better than Prozac and waitlist, you know. Um, or I really want to know if drugs, the two of them together, are better than no drugs, 
Right. So I'm, I maybe do a few plan contrasts, um, and we'll go over what orthogonal means. It just means that they're they're not related. Um, something called a trend analysis, which I just want you to be aware exists. I'm not really going to teach you more than that in this course on that, but you can learn more if you want to on that by reading other textbooks. Um, we are going to do mostly post hoc tests in this class, um, particularly the Bonferroni post hoc is a great one. Um, sometimes people like the Tukey and the Chef A. We're going to probably mostly go with the Bonferroni in this class and then examine the mean. You can just examine the mean scores, which won't tell you which ones are significant, but it might be all you need um, to report. So um, the most common things are either plan contrast or post hoc tests, um, by the way. So all right. Planned comparisons. What is that? So what you might want to do because of your interest in what your actual outcome is going to be, what your study is, you might only care about certain groups compared to other groups. You might not care about every group compared to every other group. So you might compare it about the two treatment groups versus the control group, you know, answering the question, is treatment better than no treatment? Um, or you might want to put a couple groups together, the parents of infants and toddlers, and put them together versus the parents of school age and high school children, right? And you want to kind of compare it that way. Um, so there are a variety of things to do, but you'll notice a little verses right there in the middle, right? This, these two groups versus this one group, or these two groups versus this, these two groups. Those things need to be what's called orthogonal. What that means is that you can't have two treatment groups versus the same treatment group and control group. Okay? You can't have parents of infants and toddlers versus parents of infants in high school. You can't have infants on both sides. Um, you can't have the same treatment group on both sides. So if that's the case, you're going to have to refix that. Um, and there's actually called weighting, and there's even a way you do it within SPSS, which I promise I'm not going to torture you with in my course. Um, I can't guarantee any other professors might torture you someday on this. Um, but when you add them up, essentially you weight them. On one side, you give them positive, and then you put the verses in the middle, and then the other side you give negative. So you have the two treatment groups, and you weight them each at a half um, on, the, on the positive side. And then the control group on the other side you would weight as negative um, one. And then it would be equally weighted and it would run it um, together. So you're essentially treating the two treatment groups as though they were one group the same size as the control group. And you're kind of weighting the outcome. So just be aware that this is one of the downsides and the upsides of doing this type of analysis. But it's planned. And planned analyses in general are better in research. Um, then post hocs. All right, post hoc tests um, have slightly different methods. They're actually, when you look at SPSS, you're going to see like 15 different options. And generally, I'm going to point you towards Bonferroni. That will make it easy. Uh, but Tukey and Chefe are commonly used. These things compare the means for all your groups and tell you which ones are significantly different from each other. It is a fairly powerful and robust analysis. You don't need to do adjustments for these most of the time. Um, and it will give you a minimum significant difference number. Um, and it'll tell you, it'll give you a little graphic and it'll show you which groups are different from the other groups in your output. And it's a really nice kind of way to end your story. You know, these two groups were different from that one, but those two groups weren't different from each other. And you can t tell the end story. Bonferroni himself was just a really interesting guy. He lived from until 1960. This is just his picture. He lived in Bergamo, Bergamo, Italy. We're going to run into him again because Bonferroni shows up. He does a couple different statistics um, that are used in our field. So I just wanted you to be introduced to him. And because this was just too hilarious, I had to conclude it. Um, uh, you know, multiple comparisons. No one compares to you. Yes, that's beautiful, right? Okay. So why wouldn't you always just do post hocs? Because, boy, that just seems a lot easier than having these planned comparisons. Well, remember that generally planned research that is a priori planned ahead is better than uh, post hoc analyses where you kind of take the data as it came out, throw it up on the wall and see what sticks. Um, that is a better method because if you just kind of throw up the wall and see what sticks, you might see things that you never plan to do and you're really capitalizing on chance. So you just need to know when you run post hocs, it is a looser kind of thing to do and um, it is, while robust, it is still 
um, not as firm of an analysis as your F test would be, for instance. Um, so just be aware of that, particularly if you don't have an overall great, you know, all your assumptions didn't line up and everything didn't work out perfectly. Don't take your post talks to the bank, um, you know, and invest everything on that data analysis that you have um, because post docs can be a little bit squirrely um, on their own because they're not a priori. Okay, these are things to know from this lecture. Um, I went over this at the beginning, but just make sure that you're able to do all of these things from this set of lectures and be able to answer the questions. I hope that your uh, self-kind textbook is very helpful um, as an accompaniment for this. And this is kind of your last week in my class on the self-kind textbook. So enjoy it while it lasts. We are about to graduate from self-kind and move forward into Factorla Nova next week. Thanks, guys.